Thank you, and it's a, it's a tremendous honor to be here. Um, it was great to catch up with old friends, meet new friends, and I want to personally thank Dr. Hu for the invitation to come here. Um, so I'm going to warn everybody in advance, while my second talk today will be entirely clinical, this talk is going to go back and forth a little bit between clinical stuff and basic science stuff, so I apologize in advance. Um, so if my conflicts are listed here, I'll talk about some lab stuff, and my lab is funded by the NIH, and a small portion of my salary is paid for by the CDC for a sort of expert consulting on sepsis. Um, so the original concept of the gut and critical illness goes back over 25 years, and it's that when we get critically ill, we have a intestinal hyperpermeability, and this leads to a leaky gut, and then bacteria leave the gut lumen, and in, they go into an otherwise sterile environment, and they cause systemic illness. And it totally makes sense, because we know for sure when you have trauma, when you have sepsis, your gut does become leaky. And so I learned this in school, and I imagine most of you learned this in school. It makes total sense. And it's also proven to maybe not quite as right as we once thought it was. Um, and the way we found out this wasn't quite right, although the culturing methods weren't quite as good as they are now, is through trauma. Um, so the Moore brothers uh, took portal venous catheters, and they implanted them um, in trauma patients. And they put them at 6, 12, 24, 48, 120 hours after major trauma. And you would expect, if you have leaky guts, that what you would found is the portal vein would be totally full of bacteria. And what they found was bacteria was detectable in either the portal or the systemic circulation in 2% of the patients. And in seven of the eight patients, they found coagulant staph, which doesn't live in the gut, and it just means it's a contaminant. And so again, we have better culturing methods today, but that sort of led to the question that maybe when we talk about the gut as the quote unquote motor of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome in shock and trauma, um, that there might be something else going on. So to remind everybody about what the gut is, uh, the gut is actually made up of three parts. We say the gut, but what does that actually mean? Uh, the gut is made up of an epithelium, and the epithelium has a surface area, depending on what study you look at, somewhere between 30 and 300 square meters, which is somewhere between half the size of a badminton court. I don't actually know how big a badminton court is, but that's what's published, um, and a tennis court. Um, there's an adaptive immune system, and a lot of people don't know this and are surprised, but there's actually more lymphocytes in the gut than there are any other place in the body. There's more lymphocytes in the gut than there are in the spleen or the thymus or circulating. And finally, a microbiome, which I'm going to talk about and has got a lot of press the last few years, because there's um, 40 trillion microbes living within your intestine. That is, there's actually as many, and that number's lower. We used to think it was 100 trillion. This number's from this year. Uh, but there's as many bacteria living inside your gut as there are you in your body, which leads to an interesting concept of what counts as myself, if you have as many bacteria living inside you as you. So clinically, at the bedside, how do we measure um, gut failure? And we have them all listed over here, and they're incredibly nonspecific. So absent bowel sounds, diarrhea, bowel distension, vomiting regurgitation, high gastric residuals, GI bleeding, intra-abdominal hypotension. How important is that? Well, the number of simultaneous GI symptoms is higher in non-survivors than in survivors. But as you might imagine, none of these in and of itself predicts mortality. Whether or not your patient vomits doesn't tell you whether or not your patient is going to die. Whether or not your patient has bowel sounds, especially in this room, isn't going to tell you whether or not your patient is going to die. But if you take GI failure as a combination of them, it's defined on day one with at least three or more of these symptoms. That is independently associated with mortality. It doesn't tell you that it's causative in any way of mortality. But if your patient has gut failure with a number of different clinical symptoms, they are certainly more likely to die. Um, that's, of course, nothing even remotely biological. That's something we can look at the bedside. Are you vomiting? Can I hear bowel sounds, et cetera? Um, so then if you take this back a little bit more scientifically, are there any other potential biologic markers of gut failure? So can we look at this in the ICU? And to the best of my knowledge, this has not been done in trauma wards, but I seem to get a different paper on this every day, so I'm very confident there will be in the next couple of years. Uh, this is a study of about 103 medical, not surgical ICU patients. Um, some in septic shock, some in ARDS, looking at two different biomarkers. One is citrulline, and citrulline is a measure of enterocyte mass. And one is plasma IFABP, which stands for intestinal fatty acid binding protein, which is a measure of enterocyte damage. And so if you measure these, in theory, if the one, if enterocyte mass goes down and enterocyte damage goes up, that's not something nonspecific because we all know that if you don't have bowel sounds, that could just mean that you had surgery. It doesn't mean that you've got a damaged intestine. 
But if you actually have a measure that says, wait a second, I've got less enterocyte mass and my enterocytes are dying, that actually is something that we can look at at the bedside and say that might be meaningful. And so what they found was there was elevated AVP on intestinal fatty acid binding protein, an ICU admission, and that was associated with catecholamine support, with a higher lactate, a higher SOFA score, and a higher INR. And when there's decreased citrulline associated with a higher IAP, higher CRP, and more frequent antibiotic use. And not only was SOFA associated with 28 day mortality, which we already know, but both IFABP and citrulline were associated with 28 day mortality, suggesting that there's at least an association between enterocyte mass, enterocyte damage, and whether or not you're going to actually survive your ICU stay. Again, that's an association. So we have a lot of things that are associated with dying that do not cause you to die. And if we're talking about whether the gut is actually in some ways causing death in the ICU, in either directly or indirectly, um, that doesn't actually prove anything that tells you that there's an association. Uh, so in order to look to see whether this might be the case or not, I'm about to go into a whole bunch of basic science stuff, but then I promise you I will come back to clinical stuff. Um, here's a bunch of different ways in which we might find that the gut might actually be the driver in some way behind people dying of critical illness in the ICU. Um, so I talked to you about we don't see a significant amount of bacteria in the bloodstream or in the portal vein directly after trauma. But maybe we're looking in the wrong place. So when you leave the gut, where you go? You go into the portal vein, but where else you go? I have in this picture here. You go through the lymphs, lymphatics. So factors leave the gut, they go through the lymphatics, they go to the lung. So maybe by looking just in the blood, we were looking in the wrong place. And that led to this concept of what's called the gut lymph hypothesis. Um, this is all preclinical data, but the vast majority of it is actually in trauma. As Dr. Hu said, I'm kind of a sepsis guy more than I am a trauma guy, um, except in a previous life. But most of this data is actually in trauma, albeit in mice and in rats and in some larger animals, but not in people. Um, so we know that gut lymph flies from the mesenteric lymph duct to the pulmonary circulation. And if you ligate the mesenteric lymph duct, you can prevent lung injury. Importantly, if you take lymph from a trauma hemorrhage shock mouse and you take that and inject it into a normal mouse, that induces lung injury with the same projects. So basically, take a mouse, give it trauma, take what's going into the lymph duct, take it out, give it to a normal animal. The normal animal gets every bit as sick as the shock animal. In other words, telling us there's something damaging going from the gut of the shock animal that you can actually induce lung injury, strongly suggesting that it's actually the lymph that's causing it. But there's more preclinical evidence because if you ligate the mesenteric lymph duct in either trauma hemorrhage or burn injury, it not only prevents decrease in cardiac contractility, it improves survival. So it actually meets all of Koch's postulates. You have something, something bad comes out of it, you remove it, you put it into another animal, something bad happens to that animal, you stop it from happening, and your animal doesn't get sick. And so there's significant data that suggests that some toxic, and I'll say for lack of a better word, stuff comes, that's a good, good biological word, comes from the gut, goes into the mesenteric lymph, and if you stop it, you can prevent distant lung injury and then prevent distant systemic inflammation and actually improve survival. So that's talking about lymph, and I'm going to keep looking at my watch over here to make sure that I stay on time. Um, outside of lymph, what else is there? So again, I've told you that there's an epithelium, there's a microbiome, there's, lymph uh, there's the uh, immune system. I'm actually not going to talk about the immune system much today. Um, I'm going to take everybody back to the first year of whatever school you went to, medical school or nursing school or any other school, and I'm going to do something which is horrible, but I'm going to make you think about histology. Um, and I'm going to show you what the gut epithelium looks like in a schematic. So the gut is made up of two parts, the crypts and the villi. Proliferation happens entirely in the crypt. So you have a new cell that's born in the crypt, it divides. It then migrates up the villus, where it differentiates into the three main cell types of the small intestine, enterocytes, which absorb food, goblet cells, which make mucus, enteroendocrine cells, which make hormones. Cells then reach the tip of the intestine, where they are either exfoliated whole into the lumen, or they die by apoptosis, programmed cell death, cell suicide, and there's also a little bit of death at the bottom. This entire journey from birth to migration and differentiation to death takes three to five days. So every one of us has a different intestine than we had one week ago. We have the same heart that we had one week ago. We have the same brain that we had one year, a week ago, or 10 years ago, or 50 years ago, 
we have a different intestine than we had last week. So it is the most rapidly proliferating tissues in the body are your intestine and a number of the cells in your blood. That's important because, again, there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with this in critical illness. So this is a mouse model of cecal ligation and puncture, which is a mouse model of uh, ruptured appendicitis um, from not only Dr. Who said I was his fellowship director, the person who taught me was named Richard Hotchkiss, who was also one of his trainers. Um, this is data from his lab from about 15 years ago right now, looking at a mouse, looking what happens if you have ruptured appendicitis in the intestinal epithelium. And the arrows are showing an increase in apoptosis. So we have a normal basal amount of cell death in our intestine. But if you make an animal septic, you see a markedly increased amount of apoptosis in the intestine. Well, you might say that Okay, you stick a hole in the intestine, you see a change in the amount of death in the intestine. How about if you give an animal pneumonia? This is something we published in JAMA a number of years ago, um, saying we give an animal pneumonia. So who here thinks about pneumonia and thinks, oh, the intestine is injured? Um, but probably nobody else in the audience, right? But the truth is, when you get pneumonia, how many people do you see of pneumonia who die of hypoxemia? Almost none, right? Because we can take people and put them on 100% FiO2, put them on 15 or 20 a peep, we can prone them, we can paralyze them, we can put them on ECMO, and almost nobody dies of pneumonia from hypoxemia anymore. What do they die from? They die from multisystem organ failure. They die from injuries to tissues that are other than their lungs. So these are mice that were giving pneumonia. These are clinically relevant models of pneumonia. Pseudomonas pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia, things that we actually see as clinicians. And these are looking at the intestines, the different types of stainings, the top is caspase 3, the bottom is H&E, it doesn't matter. But the bottom line is, you give an animal pneumonia and you see a marked, marked increase in the amount of death in a pneumonia in the intestinal epithelium. We see the exact same thing in patients, because you might say, I'm just a mouse doctor or a rat doctor, I actually do see patients. But, okay, what happens if we take patients? This is an autopsy study we did at WashU immediately after people die. If you ask somebody for an autopsy and you know why they died, they're almost always going to say no. If you ask somebody for an autopsy and you say it's for medical research, almost always they're going to say yes, especially if you open their old laparotomy, because you don't even have to make a new incision, because you can get every single tissue in the entire body except for brain through a trauma laparotomy. And so we did this study, and we actually took um, tissue from people who died of sepsis, and we took people from tissue from people who didn't die of sepsis, and we found out that there was an increase only in two different tissues in the entire body of apoptosis, um, in the gut and in circulating blood. And what it turns out is, there's a massive amount of gut cell death in sepsis, but if you die of a heart attack or if you die of a gunshot to the head, there's not. So that again is associative. I've told you that there's a huge amount of increase in cell death in critical illness. That doesn't tell you that it's bad. It tells you that it's there. Um, so how do we address that? We take these transgenic mice that overexpress BCL2, which is a gene that specifically prevents apoptosis, and we express it exclusively in the intestinal epithelium. So when we do this, these animals under basal conditions look totally normal. So you take an animal, you prevent cell death, and under normal conditions, nothing whatsoever happens. They live a normal life, their guts look normal, they don't develop cancer, everything is hunky-dory wonderful. What happens when you make them septic? So again, I told you in sepsis, the animal on the left here, there's a marked increase in cell death. That's the red stuff, that's active caspase 3. So there's a marked increase in cell death in sepsis. What happens if we overexpress BCL2, specifically in the gut epithelium, we can prevent that cell death. So now we have a way of saying, is gut cell death in the intestine good, bad, or indifferent? Just because it's there doesn't mean it's bad. It might be protective for all we know. It's like take trauma. You know, you normally think hypotension is bad, but which one of us wants to make our patients with trauma have a map of 120? That's a bad thing. You know, you actually, there are times that there are, there are adaptive things that are typically abnormal, but they're actually adaptive to the body. So just because there's an increase in cell death doesn't mean it's bad, it means it's there. So how do we find it? We actually now can look at these animals and look them for survival. So we overexpress BCL2, we prevent gut cell death, we make an animal septic, and what happens? You have a twofold improvement in survival if you are looking using an intra-abdominal model of sepsis. That suggests that gut cell death is actually bad and is something that we could potentially target clinically. But I told you, who here thinks about pneumonia and thinks about the gut? I do. Maybe one more hand will go up now? Yeah, one. Okay, two, two of us now do. Um, so, but look at this. We prevent cell death only in the intestinal epithelium in pneumonia, where you're not touching the gut, and mortality goes down tenfold. So if you change the gut, you change secondary things, and you don't die. 
suggesting that potentially there are ways in the future that we can actually target the gut. So that's cell death, but there's a lot of things this the intestine does. Now, I told you that um, permeability, it's not as simple as just things going into the bloodstream. But that doesn't tell you that there's nothing related to permeability at all. So how else might alterations be changed? Well, there is the gut barrier. The gut barrier is, under basal conditions, pretty tight. So things don't leak through. You have things in the, in the lumen, and they come out in your poop. What happens when you get sick? Your tight junctions, which keep these things together, become leaky. They're there for a reason. So you do want things to be able to get through. You want water and solutes to be able to get through. You don't want bacterial products and bad stuff to get through. Um, what happens under, and this is kept by tight junctions, and they're compromised on critical illness. So what happens in critical illness? This is a, again, using the mouse model of ruptured appendicitis. There's multiple models showing what happens to permeability after you make an animal septic. So as early as six hours, and I actually have data separately that as early as one hour, you have a marked change in the permeability. Your gut becomes leaky, and it stays leaky for at least two hours. Um, there's an awful lot of things that can mediate this. I'm kind of mostly skip over the slide, other than to say it's not everything in the intestine that goes haywire. There are some specific mediators, and this one, Claudin 2, Claudin 5, Occludin, Jam, and Zell 1, that are specific mediators, molecules that we can change, because we can knock one of these out or we can increase them, depending on what it is. And if we do that, we could potentially change the gut barrier. So the question is, what happens if we target permeability? Again, every time I show you something that shows there's an association, you should say there's an association, there's not a causation. And I am a clinician, and I do not care if there's an association. I care if what you're telling me there's a caus causative thing, because maybe it's not going to make a difference to my patient today, but maybe in 5 or 10 or 15 years it will if we can change that thing, which is causative. So I've shown you they're associated. What happens if we change that? Um, the next couple of slides are unpublished under review right now. Um, this is something called MLCK, myosin light, chine, light chain kinase which alters the tight junction. I'm not going to get too much into the basic science of it other than to say when it's there, it rearranges the actin myosin ring and it causes more permeability. And if you knock it out, you'll have less permeability. So again, don't worry so much about the name of the molecule. What we're taking here is a genetic approach to say, can we knock out permeability, make it more normal, what happens? So I've already shown you this slide. This is a regular animal after sepsis permeability goes way up. What happens in the knockout animals? Because I've told you theoretically this can prevent it. It actually does. So permeability doesn't change at all. After sepsis, 6 hours, 12 hours, et cetera, permeability is exactly the same. So this allows us to answer the question, if you change permeability, do you change outcome? Because if ultimately the outcome is the same, there's an observation, doesn't mean anything. If mortality goes way down, it tells you that changing gut permeability can actually change outcome. And this is what we find. If you change gut permeability, you actually have effectively 100% survival against something which is otherwise 80% lethal, suggesting that there's another way potentially in the future, and there are small molecule inhibitors that potentially could um, change this. In the seven minutes I have left, I'm going to talk about the microbiome. Um, again, you have 40 trillion microorganisms in your body, as many bacteria as you in your body. And if you read the news on anything, the microbiome turns out to affect every single thing in the world. So what do we do to the microbiome clinically? Because I actually told you it's not going to be all basic science, I promise. We give bacteria probiotics. We transplant bacteria, stool transplant. We decrease, not in the United States, but in the Netherlands and in other portions of the world, bad bacteria by selective decontamination of the gut. And oddly, every one of these works. So. Probiotics, the whole idea is that you're changing the gut flora to make it more normal. And does it work? Here's two meta-analyses. The bottom one actually just came out like last week. Um, meta-analysis of 30 trials of 3,000 patients. Reduced infections, reduced ventilator-associated pneumonia. Now, most of the trials aren't so good, and so there's huge caveats. Low quality evidence, heterogeneity of study times, and outcome measures. But the bottom line is if you give probiotics to your patients nowadays, it's reasonable based upon 30 trials to suggest this might decrease infections, this might decrease ventilator-associated pneumonia. How about stool transplant? We don't do this in the ICU. There's one case report out there in the ICU, and actually no one just came out yesterday. So there's now three case reports in the ICU um, of using stool transplant. So we don't do it in the ICU, but we do do it for our patients. How do we do it? Basically, you take stool. It sounds disgusting, right? You take stool and you give it to um, somebody through their NG tube or through a colonoscope. It sounds awful, right? 
Um, it sounds awful until you look at this. Um, this paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, they're giving stool transplants to people with recurrent C. diff. So patients with recurrent C. diff, you give vancomycin, it fails. So you give more oral vancomycin, and what happens? There's a 30% cure rate. This is either horrible or life-threatening if you develop toxic megacolon, people die of C. diff. What happens if you give a stool transplant? There's a 93% cure rate. Okay, this has now been validated. This, this original study was only in nine or 10 patients, um, but this has been now replicated in many places such that this is actually standard of care. And there's actually ways you can actually take stool, again, this sounds gross, in a pill. Um, and so the bottom line, it sounds awful, but if I said to you, you have a disease with a 30% chance of being cured or a 94% chance of being cured, which would you take? And all of a sudden, it doesn't sound so awful. Um, selective decontamination of the gut, something nobody in this room has ever done unless you guys happen to live in the Netherlands or some other countries in the world. I haven't done it either. But in actuality, for everything we do in the ICU, this is the single biggest evidence base we have. Um, what it actually does is it takes a combination of systemic and oral antibiotics to decrease, quote unquote, bad bacteria and leave good bacteria behind. Does it work? 29 high quality studies, odds ratio of death of 0.73. It is actually by far the best data we have of anything that survives, survive, improves survival in the United States, or I'm sorry, in the world. Why don't we do this? We don't do this because of fear, and I'm totally down with that. When I went to medical school, there was no such thing as VRE. When my boss went to medical school, there was no such thing as MRSA. We created them. For the younger people in the audience today, you're gonna say when I was in school, there was no such thing as this fill in the blank super bug that we're creating by overusing antibiotics. So if you give systemic and oral antibiotics to everybody, in theory, you're going to change resistance. The truth is with, with literally hundreds of studies of SDD right now, almost all in the Netherlands, they haven't found any change in resistance at all, but there's almost no resistance in the Netherlands. There's no MRSA, there's no VRA. And so potentially in those circumstances, this is okay. So we don't actually know whether this should be done. It clearly saves lives, but at the same time, if we create super mutant bugs, it's not worth it. So there's two large international trials not involving the United States right now looking at this, because if we have something that decreases deaths by 25%, that's awesome beyond belief. If we have something that decreases deaths by 25% and the cost is we create all these new superbugs that we'll not be able to trade, it's not worth it. Here's a couple of mechanistic um, insights of microbiome that might change the world as we know it. This is something um, just published in a different form, but not in this exact figure, so it's still unpublished. I see microbiome project. This is taking healthy patients. This is about 1,300 healthy patients and 115 ICU patients. The red are the healthy patients, the blue are the ICU patients. I'm not going to get into how this was done. It's incredibly complicated, although it's all open source stuff. The bottom line is you look at the ICU patients and you look at the healthy patients and they look nothing like each other. This is why. At ICU admission, the most abundant organism in your intestine makes up 25% of bacteria. So you have a thousand different bacteria types in your colon, but one type makes up 25%. By the time you leave the ICU, one type makes up 95%. So most of those 95% type percent, um, most of that thousand species go away. They're killed and you end up with just a couple of different types of bacteria. You have this total crash of diversity and then long diversity predicts long ICU stays. So does it affect outcome? In the ICU, we can't say for sure yet, um, but this is an incredibly cool study which was done um, in bone marrow transplant patients. I understand it has nothing to do with trauma, but it's such a cool study that I think it's worth showing. Um, these are patients who, before they get their bone marrow transplant, they look at the stool. This is before they get their bone marrow transplant. They look at their stool and they say, do you have diverse bacteria in your colon? And they brought them down to high, medium, and low. And then they followed them for three years after their BMT. If you have high diversity, your mortality is 50% less than if you have low diversity. Simply the amount of diversity in your stool, how, how broad your stool is, how many types of bacteria you have in your stool, changes your outcome to three years of a bone marrow transplant. Imagine if we could do this in the ICU. Beyond that, the microbiome can actually change its behavior and virulence. This is, I think, from a friend of mine, John Alverdi, and debatably the coolest study I have ever seen. You take Pseudomonas and you inject it into the cecum of a mouse. You then take that Pseudomonas out and put it into a healthy mouse. And what happens? Nothing. Take Pseudomonas, inject it into a mouse, give it a 30% hepatectomy, non-lethal but an ischemia reperfusion injury. You then take that Pseudomonas out of a mouse and put it in a different mouse. Same Pseudomonas. It now kills all of them. Same Pseudomonas, 
inject it into two different mice, two non-lethal things, pull them out, put it into a different mouse, one all die, one all live. Why is that? Because bacteria have the capacity inside our bodies to change how virulent they are. I'm 51 years old and my bacteria have globally lived happily with me for 51 years. I do good things for them, they do good things for me. If I get sick tomorrow, that relationship will change and they will change their own selves to attack me because they're going to say, my environment is different. I can now attack you and I'll have a better survival advantage. So it's not just antibiotics, it's not just killing bacteria. It's actually trying to take, tell bacteria, don't get crazy, don't attack me. So can we change that? I think this is my last data slide. The answer is actually yes. So again, preclinical, the thing that bacteria sense to determine whether or not we're really sick or not is phosphate. Intraluminal phosphate, it doesn't work if you give IV phosphorus, unfortunately. If you can give intraluminal phosphate, and that's the top left one here, basically you trick the bacteria into thinking, I'm not sick, there's nothing wrong with me. Therefore, the bacteria, same number, they say, I'm not gonna attack you, you're all good. And because of that, look what happens to survival. You trick them into saying you're healthy, and all of a sudden, you live, no antibiotics at all, just tricking the bacteria into thinking you're healthy. So can we protect the gut and critical illness today? Perhaps, a little bit. I know there's a talk later on feeding your patients. Do feed your patients early, enterally. Um, in the future, what might we target? Bad things that come out of the lymph. Epithelial damage, cell death. Permeability, the diversity and virulence in the microbiome, and also changing the microbiome. And I didn't even talk about it today, but adapt the adaptive immune system. Bunch of basic science work. I don't do any of it. I just get, get to fly around the world and give talks. Um, these are the people who do the work for my lab. And as uh, Dr. Hu mentioned, I am uh, the immediate past president of the Society of Critical Medicine. So it was wonderful joining you guys in Arizona. Please join us in Hawaii in a couple of months. Thank you.